Do you remember what we talked about last week? Uh, last week we talked about conflict and compromise. Look at this Sunday. Very different. Conflict and split. And so we have a conflict again, but with a different outcome. And so we come, and it's all in the same chapter. Do you think, do you think perhaps the Holy Spirit had something to do with putting these two conflicts in the same place in His Word? I'm pretty sure He did as we look at these two. So we're going to continue this morning. You've got your handout. Um, and you'll see, just take a quick look at it. I've given you some things to, to consider. And then if you want to, you can go ahead and switch to the, you can look to the back side because that's where we're, gonna go, that's where we're going to go this morning. So you can just follow along in the, on, the, on the back sheet if you want to. And if you want to look at it while, while, we're, while, we're, uh, while I'm talking, and then if you want to give it back at the end, you're welcome to do that as well. But it's just for those of you who would like it. And I hope you have your Bibles as well. Um, so here we go, conflict and split. Last week we looked at the conflict that arose in the church. And remember, remember what it was? Uh, the conflict basically was all of you Gentiles who are Christians, you really have to keep the law of Moses. Basically, you have to become Jewish if you want to be Christian. And to us that seems like, well, that has nothing really to do with us, Jewish, Gentile, all of that. But in fact, at the heart of it, was an issue that affects all of us and many of us have dealt with and at the heart the issue was the work of Jesus is not enough for salvation you've got to do something to make yourself acceptable to God how many of us have struggled at times we know what the Word of God says we know that Jesus died for us and yet we have heard or we think or we labor in some way to make our lives acceptable to God if I do this God will really accept me if I do this God will really love me Almost all of us have struggled with this, haven't we? And so what we read here, what we read here is Paul and Barnabas saying, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. And brothers and sisters, Jesus is enough. Church is not enough. Good deeds are not enough. Oh, it's good to come to church. It's good to be part of church. It's good to do good deeds. It's good to give an offering. But none of these things save us. If any of these things saved us or made us right with God, Jesus could have stayed in heaven and you and I could have worked our fingers to the bone to be acceptable to God. But Jesus is enough. And Paul and Barnabas fought to make sure that everybody understood and that the Gentiles saw and that the Jewish church agreed Jesus is enough and so they came together the conflict was so tough that Barnabas and Paul came all the way back down to Jerusalem they had a huge council have you ever been in a in a long meeting before yeah have you ever been in one that lasted several days because this probably lasted several days have you ever been in one that's been tough this one would have been tough but how did it end it ended with harmony and peace because both sides compromised they didn't compromise on truth but they gave up some things that were important to them on each side and still kept the essentials of salvation. What a lesson for us. We would like to believe that Christians float on clouds of love. Don't you want, do you think Christians, we just float on clouds of love and everything is great and everything is okay? But the sad truth and the painful reality is we face conflicts as Christians. And very often, those conflicts are within the church, right? And they're often most painful within the church, aren't they? Because it's our brothers and our sisters. 
So some of you are going through conflict right now. Some of you are at peace right now, but if you're at peace right now, let me go ahead and tell you conflict is coming, okay? <laughs> that, and that, I'm not being a prophet of doom, but that's just the, that's the way it is because we live in a fallen world and we are imperfect human beings brought into um, the perfect love of God. But as we look at a different conflict today, I want to remind you of something. On both sides, last week as we looked at it, time was given to listen to one another. How many of you, when you're in a conflict, find it so frustrating when the other people don't listen to you? The other side doesn't listen to you. They just keep on. You try to say something and they blah, 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 like that. And that's, we all kind of laugh, but it's extremely frustrating, isn't it? It's extremely frustrating. And the beautiful thing that we see here is that both sides, even though they disagreed, they took time to listen. Paul and Barnabas listened, and James, they listened to what the Judaizers said. The, the Jewish, the Pharisee party, they listened to what Paul and Barnabas said about the Gentiles. Number two, time was given for the Holy Spirit to work. How many times have you and I in an argument, in the heat of the moment, boom, made a decision? And you made it when you hadn't given time for the Holy Spirit to work and to settle your emotions. It was often a bad decision, wasn't it? It often brought... Um, brought painful things rather than good things. And so we see this beautiful picture and what comes out of it is harmony and peace. The devil wanted to destroy the church or put it in bondage and instead because people were godly and they listened to the Holy Spirit and they obeyed the leading of the Holy Spirit, God brought something good out of it. Paul and Barnabas go back to the Antioch church. Judas and Silas, who are prophets from Jerusalem, go up to the Antioch church. They give prophetic messages, and the church is strengthened. And on their side, the Antioch church, with great joy, receives the message, even though they're going to have to give up some freedoms. Did you, did you see that? Did you, we talked at, just at the end about that. But they happily give up some freedoms. Um, that there might be harmony and unity, and the church is strengthened. So, time passes, and all is well, and Paul and Barnabas continue in Antioch. They're teaching and they're preaching. Remember, we talked before about gifts growing the church, right? Look at this verse just with me just a minute. Why, do the, why does it say teaching and preaching? Why can't they just say they're preaching? Because teaching and preaching are two different things. You say, aren't they the same thing? No. In Ephesians 4, where it talks about the, the, the apostles, the prophets, the pastors, and the teachers. So there is, you've got preaching and you've got teaching. So all of this is going on with many others also. There are a lot of people who are serving in the church, and that's a good picture, and that's the way that it's supposed to be. So there's a team ministry, and there's a balance of gifts, okay? So Paul talks to his friend and to his ministry partner, hey, let's follow up and let's go back and visit the cities where we were previously, where we preached the word of the Lord. Let's see how the new believers are doing. Now pause here just a, just a minute because we're going to talk about conflict today, which is not so pleasant. But I want you to see something beautiful in the meantime. Paul and Barnabas went to these cities. They preached the word. People responded to the word. There were decisions for the Lord. And people said yes to the Lord. But that is not enough. Did you know that? That's not enough. We've got to continue in the Lord. We've got to be established in the Lord. We've got to be encouraged in the Lord. Being part of the family of God is more than coming to church on Sunday mornings. I'm glad you're here and it's Sunday morning, but that's not enough. Part, being part of the family of God is being part of the family. And here you see Paul Though he is fiery, though we're going to see this morning that he is a hothead. He really is. Paul's a hothead. We see here the heart of the pastor who says all of those people that raised their hands and said, yes, I want to follow Jesus. We've got to make sure they're doing okay. 
that we've got to make sure they're going on in the Lord. That's the pastor's heart. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world that really promotes independence and isolation. I really think that. Don't you think so? Do your own thing. All of us. That's, that's the way the world is today. But when you become a Christian, God brings you into his family. You're not on your own. You're part of the family of God. And we grow together. And we bear one another's burdens. And we pray for one another. And when somebody stumbles, we come alongside and we help pick them up. And when somebody rejoices, oh, we rejoice with them. How many of you have ever rejoiced about something? Thing, you were happy about something and you didn't have anybody to share it with. Wasn't quite so happy, huh? Wasn't quite so joyful. But when we have others to share with, there's greater rejoicing. And we have, when we have others with whom to mourn and cry, our sorrow is reduced. That's just the way it is, isn't it? That's just the way it is. That's what it is to be in the family of God. And here we have this beautiful heart of the pastor. Paul that says, let's go back. Let's make sure they're okay. Because you know, this was a hostile environment. People were opposed to Christianity. Paul had been stoned. Persecution had risen. But they say, hey, let's go. Let's make sure that they're doing okay. May I say something to you this morning? If you have been instrumental in leading somebody to the Lord, make sure you follow up on them. Make sure you get in touch with them if they're not here. Pastors don't, we, we see a lot, but you know what? We pastors, we don't see everything. We don't know everything. A lot of times you know more of what's going on with people in the church than we do. You know, oh, this person is struggling. Well, come alongside them, encourage them, pray for them. You don't have to dig and say, now what's going on? I see there's something wrong. Talk to me, tell me about <laughs> Just pray for them. Just sometimes, sometimes we're just curious, aren't we? We just want to say, well, I want to know. I want to know. Instead, pray for, pray for. And, and sometimes it's helpful to, to, sometimes it's helpful to know more. But we're in a family. Let's be a family. Let's be a family. And so we see this here. And so Paul says to Barnabas, and it's a great idea. It's a great idea. Barnabas and Paul are co-workers. They are co-partners. They are in leadership together. They are mature and gifted. Both of them bring something to, to the table. Both of them have an idea. The problem is it's not the same idea. <laughs> okay, so here we get into the conflict. Barnabas wanted to take along John Mark, but Paul did not think it appropriate or wise to take along this man it would have been a very young man, by the way, who had deser deserted them in Pamphylia. Ah! Remember when we came across this earlier? The only thing Luke said was, John Mark left them in Pamphylia and went back to Jerusalem. That sounds like it was part of the plan, right? Now we come sometime later and we find out, nope, it wasn't part of the plan. He broke the plan and he Deserted. That's a strong word, isn't it? That's a word that we use for people who run away from their army duty. You're a deserter, right? In every country, it's the same word. And Paul says, no, he has not continued with the work. So they're going to go on a trip. This will be the second missionary journey. And Barnabas has a great idea. We need a helper. Let's take John Mark. And Paul sort of agrees. And he says, you're right, we need a helper. Let's not take John Mark, okay? So here we have this, and here comes the conflict. So this morning as we look at it, I want you, I hope you are doing more than just saying, ay ya, 2,000 years ago, two hot-headed Jewish men. What does this have to do with us? This has everything to do with us this morning. And we can ask ourselves right now, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me this morning? Because he's going to talk to us this morning. I want you to think about these two men just a minute. There, this is not about doctrine, is it? Yes or no? No. It's not about salvation, is it? No. Is it essential? No, not really. Do you know what I have found? Most of the time, in the church of God, in the church family, when we have conflicts, it falls into this area, doesn't it? Personality, different opinion, things like that. And so as we look at this this morning, uh, let's, let's look at why they have an argument and what they do about it. 
So let's look at Barnabas and Paul. Let's get into their heads just a minute. You know we don't preach psychology at Lighthouse, but let's, let's look at it because you know what? Their personalities and, and their psychological makeup, this is part of it. This is part of it. But God cares about our personalities. He works in and through our personalities. He works in and through our psychological makeup. Please don't think prayer and this and that and Sunday morning, God, that's for you and everything else is not for you. I handle that. It all comes under God's hand. Why would Barnabas say, let's take John Mark? Th let's think about it. John Mark is available. He's willing to try again. You say, Pastor Jennifer, you cannot say that. It's not in the Word of God. I can say it because, uh, you're right, it's not in the Word of God. But God has given me a brain and I have a thought process. Remember, Paul and Barnabas, in the first big conflict, they travel down to Jerusalem. Where is John Mark? Thank you. He's in Jerusalem. Do you think Barnabas talked to John Mark while he was in Jerusalem? Yes or no? Thank you, Keith. Of course he did. Of course he did. Do you think John Mark expressed perhaps remorse or I'm so sorry, I'm this or I'm that? I think he had to have. If John Mark had said, well, you all were wrong and I'm glad I came home, there's no way a godly man like Barnabas would have suggested, let's take John Mark. No way. So does that make sense to us? Of course. So there would have been discussion between John Mark and Barnabas. John Mark would have expressed something that would have let Barnabas know, this is a good young guy. Let's give him another chance. He's available. He's available. He's failed, but he has potential. And you know what? Isn't that just like Barnabas? Barnabas always saw potential in people. He always looked beyond just the externals and he saw potential. Praise the Lord for those of you and those of us who have Barnabas eyes to see potential when others don't, right? That is needed in the church, okay? What else? Barnabas says, besides, everyone deserves a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth chance. How many of you have always, always gotten it right the first time? You never blew it. Anybody? If anyone raises your hands, then I'll say, and then you're a liar. And so, <laughs> and so you've blown it. And so you've blown it. Bless his heart. Here's Barnabas. He is the he is the, the, the guy of second chances. He's the guy of check, second chances. We can see why Barnabas would say, yeah, let's, let's take John Mark. Do you think these are good reasons? Yes or no? I think they're good reasons. Yeah, I think so too. But then there's, and Barnabas was a spiritual godly man, right? Okay, but let's go, and by the way, and he's my uh, relative also. We are drawn by, by personal issues as well. And so he's failed, but he needs to be encouraged. Let's give him another chance. Let's give him another chance. So that's Barnabas. But here's Paul. What does Paul say? What do you, why do you think Paul disagrees? I think Paul disagrees because he thinks the stakes are too high. God's work is too important to leave to chance, right? Do you think so? I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Why else? He deserted before it even got hard. Remember when John Mark left them? Okay, there's a little bit of chatter going on over here. Sorry, I, I, my, my attention is kind of, thank, thank you, thank you. He deserted before it even got hard. He deserted before there was any persecution. He deserted before anybody had thrown a stone. He deserted before anybody had raised a fist. He deserted before anybody had said, you're wrong. He left them. And Paul knew there is hardship ahead. I was stoned. Persecution came. John Mark couldn't even take the little bit of trouble. What chance does he have of making it when persecution comes? Because there's going to be more persecution. What else does Paul say? And I think this must have been a large part of it. You say, Pastor Jen, that's not in the Bible, in, in the book of Acts. That's true, but all I have to do is read everything else that Paul writes later on in the New Testament because he talks about the high call of God, doesn't he? 
Remember that? He talks about, he has called me to this. Remember what Paul says in Philippians? I press towards the prize. I press towards the goal for the prize of the high calling of God in Jesus Christ. This is the Paul who says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. Paul was someone who had paid a price and was willing to pay a price for the call of God and the work of God and to see a young man who said, yeah, 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 I'll go, and then who falls away at the first sign. For Paul, I think he would have thought, you are unworthy of the call of God. You are unworthy of of the work of God. That's what I think as we look at these two. Now I want to ask you something before we go any further and I want here's the here's the question here's the polling as we sit here this morning uh, by the way I talked with somebody and a few weeks ago about this and and the person said to me I could never work with Paul. <laughs> I, I might not be able to work with Paul either <laughs> okay if we were taking a poll would you lean towards Barnabas' side or towards Paul's side? Oh, wait, let's go this way. Bar Barnabas. Barnabas, just wave a little bit. Wave a little bit. <laughs> okay. How many of you would lean towards... I assume everybody else, unless, you're, unless you don't want to commit. How many of you would sort of would lean towards Paul's side? Okay. And you know what? You sort of know how I'm leaning because you saw how strongly I just talked about Paul, right? <laughs> okay. So we, we would tend to lean one way or another. So as we think about that, I want you, let's, let's talk a little bit about the makeup of these two men. Remember, so who's right and who's wrong? May I go ahead and say something right now about who's right and who's wrong? The Bible does not say who's right and who's wrong. And this information would have come from Paul to Luke at some point. Now, I think there's a little bit of a leaning, but the Holy Spirit, who could have said, Paul was right, Barnabas was wrong, does not say that. So it doesn't talk about who's right and who's wrong. And I think that's good for us this morning, because you and I always want to think about who's right, who's wrong, right? I think they were both right, and I think they were both wrong. I really do. There was right and wrong, which tells me what the Holy Spirit says to me, and I hope he's saying it to you too as well, is a lot of times we're partly right and we're partly wrong, right? We're partly right and we're partly wrong. We just don't see the wrong. <laughs> we, we feel the right. We feel the right. So look at Barnabas. So we look at Barnabas, and I want you to remember the nature and the character of Barnabas. What is his nature and what is his character? What is he? Barnabas the... Barnabas the encourager. Barnabas the encourager. So Barnabas, whether it was for the whole church or one-on-one, -on -one, his personality, but beyond his personality, his <laughs> gift, his, the way he expressed his service and help in the church was through encouragement. He is the one who would come alongside somebody who is discouraged and say, come on, you can make it. You can do it. Remember, this is the Barnabas who, when Saul came to Jerusalem and he was zealous and he was preaching the gospel and all the Christians were scared of Saul. He was a murderer. He was a persecutor of the church. This was the man who laid his own life on the line and personality on the line. He went and he took this young Saul and he brought him to the leaders of the church in Jerusalem and he said, Here. I vouch for him. I vouch for him. Which is what makes this argument now all the more painful, isn't it? D doesn't it? It does when you think about there. See, we look at this and we don't even think about the feelings and the heart that was involved. Their hearts must have been so grieved, so broken. There would have been, ang there would have been anger, but there would have been tears too. There would have been pain. How can this be? Why are, you, why are you being like this? And the other side saying, why are you being like this? As we look at this. So here's Barnabas. And remember also that this is Barnabas that... Um, Sorry, let me go back. So here's Barnabas. This is the one who went to the Antioch church and he helped all these new Gentile believers. This was also the Barnabas who went and found Paul and brought him back to Antioch and opened the door of ministry. Don't you think Barnabas had something in his thoughts, perhaps? Don't you think Barnabas probably felt, Paul, wh why are you being like this? 
I sacrificed for you. I laid down my life for you. You can't give up something. You can't let go something. Come on, give him a chance. I gave you a chance. But that is the nature of the encourager and the, and the gifts, those that are strongly in, the mercy, in mercy. So we've got that on one side. It's no surprise that he's willing to give a second chance. But I want you to remember the nature, and, and, and sorry, and let me say this as well. Thank God for Barnabases in the church. When you and I fail in the world, the world casts us aside, throws us away, and says, you blew it, forget you, we're moving on. But in the church of God, he gives a second chance, and a third chance, and a 100th chance. Brothers and sisters, I tell you what, if it had to be perfection, Peter would have been on the lopsop heap outside. He would have been. Peter blew it more than once. He would have been. Thank God for Barnabases in the church because we all need another chance. We all blow it. We all fail at times. Praise God for Barnabases. And praise God for Barnabases in Lighthouse as well. They are needed in the church of God. But think about Paul for just a minute. Think about his character and his nature and his calling. Paul was a man of strong passion. He was a man of zeal. And he was single-heartedly and single with single mind, devoted to fulfilling God's call on his life. And throughout his life, what did he do? The high call of God. The high call of God. Aren't you thankful for people that help us set our sights higher? Aren't you thankful for people that challenge us when we have settled into the status quo, when we've settled into it's okay like this to be a Christian, and somebody comes along who is completely sold out to God, who has paid the price to follow the Lord, and they challenge us and they say, there's more in God. Go on in God. Don't stay where you are. It's worth it. It's worth it. Thank God for Paul's. We need Paul's in the church too, don't we? We need Paul's in the church too. This is the man that God called to establish churches that would have to make it. You and I are here today because there was a Paul who paid the price with his life in hostile territory to establish the church of God that would make it when the gates of hell came against it. Thank God. Thank God. And so for someone like Paul, there's not a lot of room for trial and error, is there? The work of God is too important to leave to chance. The work of God is too important to, to say, well, okay, well, let's try. Barnabas was focused on, here's this, young, this one young man. Come on, let's give him a chance. Paul was focused on, there's the church out there. There's the church out there. And we'll come back to this in just a minute. As we look at this conflict, now we all already know the end of this story, don't we? We know what happens, but I want you to think about it in this way. We would like to say, no problem. Here are two godly men. They're spirit-filled, they are, they are focused, they're called of God, they're both men of prayer. All they have to do is talk it out and pray a little bit and everything's going to be okay, right? They're really godly, they're really godly. Sure they are, sure they are. And in fact, they've just navigated a much bigger conflict, right? The much bigger conflict with Jerusalem, with Antioch. There should be no problem in this case. What happens? So, praise the Lord, Whew. you see, that this is what we think, right? Really, really spiritual people, no, no problem. Okay, this disagreement was so sharp that they parted company. Barnabas goes one direction, and Paul chooses somebody else and goes another direction. Why is this? And this speaks to us this morning, because we're not talking about a history lesson. Here are two godly men. Here are two spiritual men. Here are leaders, strong character, both of them. I told you before who was right and who was wrong. Holy Spirit doesn't tell us, but I think both of them are right. 
and both of them are wrong. So that speaks to me as well this morning, and I hope it speaks to you. And so they decide, and, and as we look at this, I think, think about leadership, because there are those of us that are, those of you also that are called to leadership. And do you know what I have found, generally speaking, those called to leadership generally have strong character, stronger personalities. It's needed for the demands of leadership, to face the, to face the things, to face the criticism, to face the difficult decisions, and to go through, and not, to not wither, and to not fall by the side. But it carries with it difficulty as well, because that strength many times is not, it's hard to be humble. It's hard to bend. It's hard to give in. And so here we have these two men, and they part company. They cannot agree. Is there a biblical example for this? Yes, there is. And let's look at it. All the way back in the Old Testament, when we talk about Abraham and Lot, all the way back, you say, well, all the way back to the Old Testament? Sure. And you know what? Barnabas, Barnabas and Paul would have known this very, very well. They're Bible scholars. They know the Word of God. We go back, just look with me for just a minute, at this Old Testament example. They're both, this is Lot and Abraham. And they have so many possessions. God has blessed them. They have so much that there is that the land can't support because at, in those days wealth was measured generally with cattle, right, or with with sheep, with cows, with goats in that way. And so they each have so much as they travel together that there's quarreling not between Abraham and Lot, okay, but between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. So here's this quarrel, and then what happens next? We already know. Look with me. Then Abraham said to Lot, please let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and my herdsmen. What does he say? He says, since we are brothers, ouch, <laughs> okay? Isn't the whole land before you? Separate from me. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I will go to the left. Brothers and sisters, this morning, what a beautiful picture of how peace comes out of conflict. Abraham was the elder. Abraham had the right. Lot was the one who had followed along with Uncle Abraham. He lived under his wing. He lived under his protection. He lived under all of this. Lot should have been the one to say, Uncle Abraham, I'm so sorry that there's quarreling. Let me do this. But he didn't. We look at compromise and giving up our rights as weakness. That's what the world tells us. You got to be strong. Show them whatever, all, all sorts of things. Brothers and sisters, in God's eyes, it is the bigger person. It is the more spiritual person that is willing to give up and to let go. And Abraham has a very good reason for it. Because we are brothers. Now here's a lesson for us this morning. Why do we give up things in the family of God for the sake of peace? We give up things because we're brothers. We give up things because we're sisters. Relationship with brothers and sisters is more important than holding on to some things that we say, it's my right, it's my right, well they shouldn't, well they this, well they that. Abraham, the father of faith and the father of us all, shows us the way of peace. We don't want to do it. And, and, and he says, I'll go left. If you go right, I'll go the other way. And so they couldn't come to peace. And so Abraham realized, okay, there's got to be some space. Brothers and sisters, sometimes there has to be space. That's just the way it is. Sometimes there has to be space. And so Paul and Barnabas do that too, right? So there's space. But Paul and Barnabas go about it in the wrong way. They go about it in the wrong way. Abraham and Lot go about it in the right way. And Abraham says, you choose, and whatever you choose, I'll go in the other direction. We don't want to do it because we think, I'll be taken advantage of. How many of you think that, right? If I give up, but I'm right. I'm right. They're wrong. Well, in this case, Abraham was right. Sorry, Abraham was righter 
than Lot was. Lot was wronger than Abraham was. Pardon me, all you English teachers. We don't want to give it up because we think, well, I'm right. I have the position. I have more whatever. I have this. I have that. But Abraham shows us a way of peace. Abraham trusted not in himself to keep what he, he deserved. Abraham trusted God. And we know the outcome of this story, don't we? What happened? Abraham gave up. He let Lot choose. Lot chose selfishly. Lot chose what he should not have chosen. But who did God bless? God blessed Abraham. And I want to tell you something this morning, brothers and sisters. If you're in a struggle and you're in a conflict, and I'm not saying just people can stomp all over you, think, well, they're going to stomp all over me. That's not what I'm talking about. Because the Bible gives wisdom in, in, in all these various areas. But I want what I want to say to you is this. If you are in a struggle, it may be with a friend. Listen, brothers and sisters, it may be with a co-worker. It may be with a spouse this morning. Sometimes our biggest struggles are with spouses. If you are willing to let go and kind of give up some things and say, okay, God, I want to have peace. Why? We're in the family together. We're in the family together. We're brothers and sisters. Jesus died for us. Is it worth it to hold on to a silly disagreement or argument when Jesus has died for us? No, well, I, that's where I sit and they know I sit there and they sat in my chair. Now you all laugh, but I know that's true. I have seen people, I'm so sorry to tell you, in Lighthouse say, move, that's where I sit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dad, for many years in the U.S., as, as, as people say, now you stop preaching and you've gone to meddling now, Pastor Jennifer. Dad, for many years, was the presbyter of many churches in... Uh, I'm gonna, it's warm up here. It's very warm up here. Is it warm out there? Whoo, okay, here we go. Sorry. For many years he was the presbyter, uh, over, uh, responsible over many churches, and he would preside over church disagreements. And I remember he came back one time, and he did, didn't even tell us what church it was. He was so discouraged because the church had split over the color of the new carpet. <laughs> one group wanted blue and one group wanted red and they couldn't agree and they split. Now you and I say, we laugh at that and we think how ridiculous, but my beloved brothers and sisters, are there people in Lighthouse that we're holding a grudge against, that we're not talking to because they did something trivial it, they didn't mean to do it. They this, they that. It wasn't a big deal, but we took it the wrong way and it hurt us. And we won't fellowship with them and we won't talk with them. We are brothers and sisters. And Abraham said, we're brothers. Let's not argue. This is the example. God help us to follow Abraham and not Paul and Barnabas in this situation. And so... They separate, and probably by agreement, Barnabas takes Mark, goes off to Cyprus. That's a good decision. You know why? Cyprus was home territory for Barnabas, and John Mark would have been with him. And in Cyprus, there hadn't really been any opposition, and there hadn't really been persecution. So for a young man who needs a second chance, that's a good way. That's a baby step, isn't it? And then Paul chose Silas and he went through Syria and Cilicia, and that was a good choice for him too, wasn't it? Why was it a good choice? That was Paul's home territory. He was from Tarsus, and Tarsus was in the area of Cilicia. And he chose Silas. Why was that good? Because Silas was one of the ones who had brought the letter from Jerusalem. Silas was a Roman citizen, just like, uh, just like Paul was, so he would have some of the protection of the Roman government. Silas had gifts and things that, that were different from Barnabas, so Silas was a good choice for Paul. Do you know what I think? I think probably it was God's intention for there to be a separation. The problem was they went about it in the wrong way and there was anger and there was there were hard words. That's what the Bible makes clear to us. 
Was the devil at work? Yes, the devil was at work. The devil wanted to divide and destroy. But God divided and multiplied, right? God divided and multiplied. Was there, and I, sorry, I wanted to say one thing. I, I didn't say it earlier, um, and I think it's, it's, it's important. When we, uh, sorry, this is out of the loop for just a minute. When we were talking about the strengths of Barnabas and about Paul, this is something that I really saw and was, was reinforced. When you and I are, when, as we see from Paul and Barnabas, very often when we are strong in one area or we have gifts in one area, we don't have a lot of mercy for somebody who is weak in that area. Have you noticed that? We don't. It's very, very true. It's very, very true. And we see it with Barnabas and Paul. So that's, that's something we've got to pay attention to, we've got to and we've got to work on. So is there any reconciliation? The Holy Spirit does not tell us, but what we know is this. Later on, Paul writes about Barnabas as a worthy brother in Christ, a worthy laborer in Christ. Later on, Paul calls John Mark valuable, my, a son, a trusted co-laborer in the Lord. And God used Mark to, John Mark, to write the gospel of, which gospel is it? Which gospel? You're scared. It's not a trick question. <laughs> the gospel of Mark. The gospel of Mark. That wouldn't have happened if there had not been a Barnabas. I think more of us sided with Paul, but Barnabas was needed too. And there was reconciliation. And many years later, I think Paul, older and wiser and more gentle, one day would write to people in Philippians and he would write to two women who were laboring in the Lord just as he and Barnabas had. And he says, I appeal to Euodia, don't name your daughter Euodia, and I appeal to Syntyche, don't name your daughter Syntyche, to agree in the Lord. And I ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side. Oh, this is the Paul who could not make it right with Barnabas years earlier, right? And now he sees the importance of unity and harmony. Brothers and sisters, this morning, you may not be a Paul. Few of us are. There aren't a lot of Pauls, but you can be a peacemaker. True partner, help these women in the church of God and outside of the church of God. Do your words promote peace and ending of conflict with your best friend? Or do you get on your best friend's side? You're right. I can't believe they said that to you. <laughs> or do you promote harmony and unity? Can't be a Paul, but you can be a peacemaker. You may not be a prophet, but every one of us can be an encourager. Oh, how we need encouragers in the church of God. If you are part of a disagreement right now, don't get sidelined by it. A wiser and, listen, we're gonna get to heaven one day. Do you want, you want to hold a grudge and let it turn into bitterness in your heart? And we get to heaven one day and God has put us in a mansion and we look at our neighbor and we think, eh. We say, sorry God, I need a go-go van. I need to move two streets over. I've, I've had, I, I can't live next to this person. How foolish, right? How silly, of course not. We're all laughing at the, at the ludicrous example I just gave you. And yet we're acting like it sometimes down here, aren't we? We really are. And an older and a wiser and a gentler Paul later says, if possible, on your part, as much as it depends on you, live at peace. Live at peace. So if you're in a conflict, settle it. Be willing to give up some things. If you're in a conflict and you can't settle it, you can still live at peace. Give some space. Back off a little bit. Agree to disagree if you really cannot agree. And then let it go. Stop talking about it. Stop digging it up. 
stop saying, oh, look at that, that, that. let it go, let it go. That's, I mean it. I, be an Elsa. Is that why you all just laughed? That's why you all just laughed. I, I confess I have not seen, what's it called? Frozen, frozen. I'm so holy. <laughs> I've seen part of it. But honestly, now that's a sermon for us, be an Elsa, let it go. That, that's how we live at peace when we can't agree, right? Just give some space and we let it out of our hearts. In the church of God, we close with prayer and our kids are down, we, they're a little bit early, we, we've got one minute. Let's, let's pray in this, in this short time that we have left. We've laughed at some things, but you know what? I know the Holy Spirit has spoken to you this morning because He spoke to me too. What are your gifts? If you're strong in that area, 